Hi, so as you know, this week uh, we are doing online remote learning. Um, this week, uh, let's talk about production design, also known as art direction. Production design is designing everything that the actor does not use, does not interact with. So it's designing the environment or the background of the film. Uh, what kind of place are the characters moving around in? Where do they live? Where do they work? What do these places look like? What do they feel like? What are these places made of? What kind of materials? So the first thing is to try to make these environments realistic, convincing. In other words, uh, the audience should believe that this kind of character would live in this kind of place, would work in this kind of place. Now, if you are shooting a movie indoors, then you can build everything from scratch. Like if you're shooting on a sound stage, uh, uh, then you can bring in materials to build your own indoor environments. Uh, and so you have complete control over what that environment looks like and feels like. Uh, if you're shooting on location, in other words, outdoors, if you're going to a place to shoot, you have slightly less control. But if the location manager has done a good job, then you are shooting in a place that fits what the movie requires. It won't be exactly what the movie requires. There will have to be adjustments and changes. Um, so film crews, depending on what kind of production design is needed, they may change the outside of a building, paint it a new color, add on a fake facade or front. They might change the inside of a building, uh, fit new wallpaper, new furniture. They might rearrange things. I've even heard of a film that knocked down an indoor wall, and then after finishing the film production, they rebuilt the wall. That's important. If you use a location that belongs to someone else, remember you have to return it to the way it was before. This is especially important if you're shooting a historical movie. We know that things in the past looked different, not just indoors, but also outdoors on the streets. What kind of cars do people drive? Are there cars? What do the streets look like? What do people walking around wear? Uh, the clothing that they wear. All of these things uh, can be designed by the production designer and the art crew. Um, but if you change the way that a street looks, then you need to return the street to its original appearance after you're finished. So there are some companies that specialize in providing historical production design elements. For example, if you watch a historical drama and everybody is driving old cars, there are companies that specialize in renting out old cars depending on the year that you are making the movie. Now, these are to create realistic and convincing worlds for the characters to live in. But sometimes you don't want realistic. For example, last week we watched a science fiction film that is set in the future. So of course you want to make that world feel a little different, to feel like the future. Um, and now we're entering into the realm of fantasy production design, not based on the real world, not based on the past, but some kind of imagination. This is very hard to do. 
because on the one hand you can do whatever you want. But on the other hand, the audience still has to believe that these characters, these people really do live in this kind of environment. So the challenge is to build something that is both completely original and completely convincing. It takes a strong and detailed imagination to create a convincing fantasy environment. Uh, and in this case, the best kind of fantasy production design can also help tell the story. When we make a movie set in the present, we know, usually we know what that world looks like. If we make a movie set in the past, uh, people who are familiar with that time period will understand what that uh, environment feels like. But when you make a movie set in a fantasy time and space, especially if there is in the story, there is some connection with the present day, then the audience will start to think, how did we get from the present day to this new fantasy time and space? So especially in science fiction, it can't be too uh, divorced from the present day. It can't be too different from modern day. Otherwise, it will feel like it's fake. So for example, I recently watched a movie called After Yang, and it's set in the, it's a science fiction movie set in the far future. And the production design helped to tell the story of how that world was created. How did we get from today to that world? Uh, in the story, uh, the US had recently finished fighting a war with China. And the world of that movie, especially the indoor world, was full of East Asian design elements. So uh, houses made of wood. Uh, you had like paper lanterns. Pa people ate using chopsticks. It was a very East Asian feeling. And that helped to tell the story of uh, how the world was changed before and after the war. So either uh, the war was fought because the US felt defensive about maintaining its own culture, or after the war finished and trade and relations were resumed between the US and China, uh, the US had a bigger influence from China. The story of the background of that story was conveyed mostly through how the environment looked. So uh, we've been talking about real environments, right? Creating an environment or uh, changing an existing environment in order to make it better fit with the feeling and story and atmosphere of your film. But you, today you can also have digital environments. The Marvel movies are notorious for doing this. If you ever look at uh, some footage of the green screens behind the scenes of a Marvel movie, you'll realize they don't just use digital technology for special effects. Uh, we'll talk about that in week 10. They basically use green screen digital technology for anything that the actor doesn't interact with. In other words, the production design. Even if it's a simple indoor scene, a normal looking room, nothing too fancy, nothing uh, too like fantasy, they will still use green screen digital technology to create that background. And there are a number of reasons. First, it's cheaper. And second, it's more flexible. If you need to change something, you don't have to bring the actor back and reshoot the whole scene. You can simply change the image that you project onto the background uh, and, and reuse the footage that you already have. The downside is, of course, that it doesn't look as real. If the actor is not actually in that environment, 
you can tell. You can tell that they're imagining the environment and not actually in the environment. And it also makes it less likely for the actor to improvise or to change how they interact with the environment in a flexible way. So the actor is basically limited to interacting with the actual props that are in the scene that the actor can use, and they can't interact with the environment because the environment is a green screen. It's not actually there. Um, we'll talk more about the use of digital technology in week 10 when we talk about special effects. But uh, that's basically production design, how to use the environment to help you tell the story and to use uh, to give the correct emotion and atmosphere for the film that you're trying to make. Do you have questions about production design? OK, let's move on to the next part, which is location. Sometimes you will shoot a movie outdoors somewhere, so you need to choose where. Uh, there are many reasons to shoot on location. One, because if you try to recreate an outdoor environment indoors, it will look fake, uh, and uh, the actor will also be limited by the indoor space. And secondly, because some things you just can't film indoors. If you're doing stunts, tuji, or like explosions, or you you want to include shots of the larger environment, whether you want a shot of the city or you, or you want a shot of nature. For those, you really need to go uh, outdoors. Some films won't tell you which city it's set in. Instead, they'll give you shots of iconic buildings and locations that people recognize as being from this city. Or sometimes they'll even shoot at one of those locations. It's much more authentic to shoot at the actual Eiffel Tower instead of rebuilding part of the Eiffel Tower indoors. So when you're shooting outdoors, the first thing is to pick where are you going to shoot? Usually the director, uh, the location manager will talk with the director to understand what kind of places the director needs, like the, what kind of space, what kind of environment, what kind of feeling. And the location manager uh, will go and scout out some possible locations. Um, and it will always be more than one location because sometimes you'll find the perfect place, but the owner will not let you use it. Or the owner will charge you a huge amount of money that you can't afford to use that location. So uh, the director sometimes will go with the location manager to check out each place. If the film is being shot in a foreign country or the director is busy doing something else, the location manager will take many, many photos and video to make sure the director understands what this place feels like and looks like and how the place can be used. So after uh, the director chooses the locations to be used, uh, the production manager will uh, set up a shooting schedule. Remember, movies are not shot in order. They are shot according to convenience. So depending on when each location is available, depending on the weather, depending on time of day or like that, uh, local holidays, all these different elements, uh, the production manager will put together a shooting schedule on uh, like what days we can go here, what days we can go there. When you're shooting on location, you have to be strict with your schedule. If you use too much time, you may not be able to keep using the same location. So you have to follow the schedule very strictly. So before the cast and crew go to each location, 
there will be an advanced team of crew members. These people go to the location to set it up for the film shoot. They make all the changes that director thinks is necessary. They uh, make the deals with the location owners. They set up the power and the trailers where people will live. They manage and prepare everything. And once that's ready, then the key people and actors go and they efficiently shoot them what they need to shoot on that location. Now, if the location is a busy place, like in the middle of a city, then you will also need to get permission from the city to use public spaces. For example, the streets. Uh, in movies, uh, sometimes you will have like an action sequence on the street. Every background person or extra in those scenes has been hired by the film crew. There are no actual bystanders or pedestrians in those scenes. And that's because the film crew has already applied with the city to close down this part of the city in order to make a movie. And they have already uh, made a deal with each business owner and homeowner in that area so that the people there will not suddenly walk into the background of the movie. So shooting on location can be quite expensive if you're making a deal with everybody and you're paying everybody to help uh, keep to your schedule and your location restrictions. That can add up very, very fast. And this is why today, if you make a feature length movie of 90 minutes on a budget of only 1 million US dollars, that is considered a very low budget. Because making this stuff costs money. So let's say you get all the permissions, uh, you get everybody to cooperate and to make deals. Uh, you have chosen your location, everything is set, and then you shoot and the weather becomes unpredictable. Well, uh, you just got to deal with it. If your schedule is looser and you have a little more time, uh, you can try to wait out the weather until it turns better. If you don't have the time, you'll simply have to rewrite that scene as rainy or as windy. Uh, so sometimes uh, when you're shooting at a location, remember movies are not shot in chronological order. So sometimes you're shooting two scenes that uh, should fit together, but you're shooting one scene early and the other scene late and the weather does not match. In that case, you will have to, if, if you don't have enough time in your schedule to fix this, you have three options. One, after you finish shooting everything else, try to renegotiate a new time at the same location. This is, of course, the most expensive option. Your second option is to use careful editing to try to hide the weather from the image. So you can set up new lights. You can like have an overarching cover to block the rain. You can treat that location as an indoor location and hide all of the details using fast editing, cutting out the image, these kinds of tricks. Your third option is to use digital special effects. This is actually also pretty expensive. We'll talk about this during week 10. But like many people will think, oh, we can just fix that using digital technology. There's a limit to what you can fix using digital technology. It's not like magic. There is a certain kind of logic and rules you have to follow in using uh, digital adjustments in post-production. But in the at the end of the day, uh, when you encounter this kind of situation, an audience that is really paying very close attention will always be able to tell that the weather doesn't match. And you're just going to have to live with that. It's something that's outside of your control. So th this is like the technical aspect of how to use locations when shooting. 
but sometimes you will want to shoot on location, not just to make it more realistic, but to use the environment as part of your storytelling. We talked about designing an environment to help you tell the story. You can also choose an environment to help you tell the story. And this is what this week's movie does. Um, Certain Women is shot in a rural and small town location. And there are many shots of wide open space, mountains, sky, nature. And the overall effect is to let you feel what kind of place these characters live. A place where there are not many people and uh, everyone is more connected to nature and more connected to their neighbors. And that can help you understand what kind of people these characters are that choose to live in this kind of place. Why don't they live in a big city? Why don't they live in a suburban area? Uh, this can help us to understand what kind of person they are. Uh, some characters choose to live in this kind of place. Other characters are there not by choice, uh, but for other reasons, maybe because of family, maybe because of the economy. Uh, but it helps to give the film um, a more coherent feeling and atmosphere. This also works for movies that are shot in the city. If your movie is fast paced, high action, very exciting, and you shoot it in the city, you can have more shots of like many buildings in the same area. You can have shots of smaller spaces, narrow streets, busier streets, more people. It gives the entire film a different feeling. Um, so that's another reason why uh, you might want to choose to shoot a movie on location and another way to use that location as part of your um, storytelling. Uh, and then one more thing to point out about location is that if a movie is set in one place and it's shot on location, the location may not be that place. So like many movies are set in New York City or London, but in fact, many of those movies are shot in places like Toronto, Toronto, or somewhere in uh, Budapest, Budapest. And first of all, the reason is because it is cheaper to shoot in these places than to shoot in New York City. But then how do they do that, right? These are two different cities. And the answer is when they're in Toronto or when they're in Budapest, they choose locations that look like some place you might see in New York or some place you might see in London or in any other city. The thing is, most Western cities look very similar in certain places. And you can use that fact to hide uh, the fact that you're not actually in the place you say you are. And so when the, when you watch the movie, they will have one wide establishing shot of the city uh, skyscrapers and the cityscape to let the audience know, oh, this is the city that our characters are in. But then when they shoot the actual scenes with the actors in close up, and the actors are actually doing things, those shots might be in a completely different city. So you can also use this idea, right? You don't have to go to the place where your characters are supposed to be. You can add like a wide shot or a broad image of that place and then just shoot your movie somewhere around campus or around Taurin or Taipei or whatever. Uh, as long as like when you're shooting the close up scenes, you don't accidentally capture an image of something that only belongs in a certain city. OK, so that's location. Do you have questions about using location?
OK, so this week we're watching the movie Certain Women. This is an example of a Western, Xibupian. But it's not one of those traditional Westerns with cowboys and horses and. OK, there are cowboys and horses, but it's not like good guys versus bad guys. It's not like the Wild West. A Western is any movie that is set in uh, the Western part of the US, which usually means somewhere east of the Rocky Mountains, Loji San, um, because west of the Rocky Mountains is desert. Although there are also Westerns that are set in the desert, so somewhere in the Western part, but also usually not in a city, because one of the main elements of a Western is the natural environment. So even though California is in the West, usually films in California are in the city. So those are usually not considered Western films. Traditionally, Western films were about the frontier era, Tuo Huang Shi Zai. So after the end of the Civil War in the middle of the 19th century, uh, now that the internal politics of the US were more settled, the government wanted to expand westward. And so the government offered anybody who could claim new land, the government would give them that land. And so many people rushed west to claim new land in the prairies, Cao-ren, uh, near the mountains and also in the deserts. People uh, traveled to the west and the country expanded so fast that the government could not keep up. So in many of these places, there is very little government. You would have a mayor. You would have a sheriff, Jing Zhang, And that's about it. So many traditional Western films are about uh, small towns with very little government and a bad guy comes to town. So how do the people who live there deal with these bad guys when there's no government. But the thing to remember about the traditional Western is that these films were made after the frontier era had ended. So from the very beginning, Western films were about the past, were about nostalgia, Huai Zhou. And many Western films were used to tell the story of how civilization so-called civilization and government came to expand along with the population and what people did to help the government come to these new places. But in the contemporary Western today, movies set in the modern day in the West, the government is already there, right? The country has already fully expanded. So contemporary Western movies are more about the lives of people who choose to, or are forced to live in rural areas. The government is there. There are small towns, but many people who live in the West still choose to live on huge farms or in the middle of nowhere, or they choose to live in small towns with only a few thousand people. Uh, and so Western films today are about the lives of these people what they care about, how they deal with problems, these kinds of issues. And that's what Certain Women is about. As you can tell from the title, Certain Women is about women. The title is a pun, Shuang Guan Yu. It could mean some women, right? Certain means Moshe. It could also mean women who are certain, women who are sure. Uh, and that becomes a question. Are these women sure? Of what they want in life? Are they sure of how to live in these places? Certain women is not just an, a, a Western film. It's also. An anthology film. Uh, an anthology film is a film. It's a it's a feature length film. A long movie, but it's made up of different short films. So it's like a few short films put together to make one long film. An anthology film usually 
there is some connection between the short films, like maybe uh, characters from one short film will show up in another short film. Uh, but sometimes there's no connection, and the only reason these films are put together is because they all express the same theme, Juti. They're all about a similar theme. Um, this film is 110 minutes long. It's made up of three parts. Each part, therefore, is about 35 to 40 minutes long. There is a little bit of uh, overlap and connection between each part, but not a lot. We can treat each part of the film as an independent short film. Uh, and all three focus on uh, the same themes. The film is by a filmmaker named Kelly Reichert. Kelly Reichert is uh, one of the few women directors working in the US. Her focus has been throughout her career on the American West and the American Northwest. So Northwest is Washington State and Oregon. Washington, uh, Oregon. Uh, the two states that are north of California. She's famous for making very small budget independent movies. Uh, she takes pride in not having to spend lots of money and therefore not having to follow the rules of major film studios. Uh, and Certain Women is her most or one of her most well known works. She recently made a better known work that a more popular work called First Cow, uh, but before First Cow, Certain Women was the most popular one. OK, do you have questions about the Western anthology films or this movie? OK, so um, let's take a 10 minute break. And when we come back, stay on teams uh, and we'll watch the movie separately at the same time. So please start the movie at 135. And the movie should therefore play until around 325. 324, 325. So please come back uh, and I will explain the midterm exam at 325.